So let me start first with the cows. And I must admit, prior to 2008, when I started working with cattle vaccines, my only knowledge about cows was coming from India. Cow is a holy animal. If you see it on the road, give him the nice Indian bread, fold your hands, and God will be kind to you. That's where my knowledge ended about cattle. All changed one morning when I was talking with an animal science technician, Jenny Greville, at about 5 in the morning. And, we st and at that time, I was working with Tim Mani, and we started talking about vaccines and what are the issues that face especially veterinary vaccines. And also, the conversation drifted to nanotechnology. And both of us, both ladies, we declared, you know, what's there in nanotechnology, another fashionable word, everyone just wants to use nanotechnology now, what can it change? Maybe nothing. And I would go back, sit on my computer, and the first, and I just Google, as we all do now, nanotechnology and vaccine delivery. And the very first slide that I come up is from Mike Treder, the director for Center for Responsible Nanotechnology, which says the same sentiment that it is so easy for us to think, you know, what can it change? We can easily slip into that mode, but it is also very easy to see that how, how wrong this can be. 1885, we never thought that we will be flying in the air and going places. 1926, television didn't exist. 1967, our life, you know, we can't live without computers these days or mobile phones. 1986, World Wide Web. And in 2005, who would have imagined that scientists and nano engineers can actually make nanoscale particles which can act as excellent delivery vehicles for a number of biomolecules. I'm sure the younger generation here might add up Snapchat and Snap Stories and Instagrams to very big things that make a big change. And in this presentation, nanotechnology was heralded as the next big step. I'm sorry if I'm sounded like a spokesperson for AIBN here, but the next big step to me is not just the nano bio, nanotechnology, but the next big step is if you add bio as a prefix in front of this nanotechnology and make it bio nanotechnology and have applications for the real world. So coming back to the issue that made me look into nanotechnology, that is vaccine development, and if we look at animal versus human vaccines, we can easily see that there is much less money invested in research as far as veterinary vaccines are concerned. There's lower sale price, smaller market size. If you look at Gardasil, greater than 1 billion US dollars. Key diseases, veterinary diseases, only 10 to 20 percent of Gardasil. However, the issues that veterinary vaccines face are almost similar to that of human vaccines. There is a need for enhanced immunity, side effects should be minimal, cost of production, how, delivery, and adjuvants. So adjuvants are helping agents which are added to the vaccines, whether it is a live vaccine or a heat killed vaccine or a subunit vaccine where we use a protein of, from the pathogen to elicit immune response. However, certain issues are really very, very specific when we think of cattle vaccines. And I will show you two videos to make that point. And this is if mustering of the cattle to do or to administer the vaccines. If multiple doses are required, these animals have to be mustered not just once, but maybe twice within a short period of two months. And this can be really a very cost intensive, arduous, laborious process, as well as stressful for the animals. This is another snapshot. Things are becoming a little better here. They are using helicopter or an aerial spray to muster the cattle once again in a farm on Northern Territory. Another very critical issue, which is again intrinsic to veterinary vaccines, is the requirement for cold chain. That is, the vaccines need to be refrigerated. 
right from the point of manufacturing to the time that it is delivered to the client. You can see a rickshaw puller in Bangladesh carrying those eskies, carrying those vaccines or a camel in the desert of Saudi Arabia. And this is what led to what my PhD student said in her three minute thesis competition, Karishma, the idea about making single and hot the new nano vaccine. That is delivering a single dose nano vaccine which can be stored on the shelf. Now this idea was first funded by Queensland Government Reinvestment Fund and the genesis of this was that I saw this information discussed with Timani and then went and met Professor Max Liu who at that time was the director ARC Center for Functional Nanomaterials. He convinced me about the benefits of silica nanoparticles as carriers and we were successful in getting that grant which led to further work and the second phase where we involved Washington State University, Queensland government and even Zoitis came as a partner. So nanoparticles as delivery system for subunit vaccines, the things, key factors that we were looking for was self adjuvants so that we do not have to add any other agent or any other helping agent into the vaccine formulation to cut down the cost and also it should be least cytotoxic. We were looking at reducing the dose number, shelf stable and another key feature we were looking for was that the nano vaccine should be able to elicit both antibody as well as cell mediated immunity. In the phase one of the project, we started working with two proteins, model protein ova albumin and bovine viral diarrhea, uh, diarrhea virus protein. It's very strange, you know, when you go to nano scientists and nano engineers, they talk about nanoparticles, small size. But when you start talking about loading proteins on those nanoparticles, they ask me, how many grams of protein can you give us? Then they don't say nanograms of proteins, little do they realize that to express these grams of proteins is not an easy task. So that was the reason that we first selected model protein over albumin as our candidate because we could buy it in large quantities from the shelf. The first particles that we used were silica nanoparticles. Now these are solid silica nanoparticles. They are mesoporous that is they have small pores on their surface, but we were looking at that time to present the protein on the surface in order to get the immune response. We found that the protein loading was very low and therefore they had to be amino functionalized to increase the protein loading. So this is without amino functionalization, this is after amino functionalization. Even then we could bind only 72 micrograms of proteins to a milligram of particles. However, we did proceed with doing our first small animal or mice trial using this OVA nano vaccine formulation. We were very worried that we didn't want to inject too many nanoparticles into the mice. So we limited ourselves to 150 micrograms of nanoparticles only at the cost that we will inject very small amount of OVA albumin protein. So we injected only maybe 2 or 10 microgram of OVA. And quile here is the traditional adjuvant which is used in veterinary vaccine applications research at the moment. And we wanted to compare whether our nano formulation, how will it behave as compared to the traditional adjuvant quile. But with quile this time we injected 50 microgram of the protein. The encouraging thing here was that we did get an antibody response both with 2 and 10 micrograms of ova, although it was not as good as when injected with quile. For me, rather than these results, this photo is very important because this was my first animal trial in my life. So it's never too late to start new things. Don't ever think that you have stopped somewhere, you know, just move on. And we again looked at um, and Im uh, cell mediated immunity as well. As here you can see, Quile was very good. We did get a response, but it was not as good as the traditional adjuvant. Karishma then during her PhD because I remember I mentioned that one of our objective was to make it shelf stable. So she also developed a freeze dried formulation of the ova albumin where she treated it with some excipients, stored it at room temperature, characterized it and then we injected this freeze dried 
nano vaccine which was stored at room temperature and again you can see we got a very nice antibody response which was comparable to the fresh nano vaccine. So, this gave us the confidence that yes, maybe we could store the nano vaccine at room temperature or on shelf. We did get cell mediated immunity again. However, as I mentioned, it was less compared to quillet, but very much comparable to the wet or the fresh nano vaccine formulation. These results then led us to move towards a real virus system rather than ova albumin and we chose bovine viral diarrhea virus because if you look at 40 years of vaccinations and 160 currently registered vaccines to eradicate a disease when you are talking about BVDV, no, nothing, it is still thriving. And another very key reason was that we had Dr. Timani, who is an expert in the area of bovine viruses, both BHV and BVDV. BVDV is nasty disease. I don't think so there is any nice disease. So they, it can cause neurological defects, infertility, ulcers, and also it can cause immunosuppression. The calves can be born persistently infected with the virus and severe acute BVDV can lead to the such things. Sorry to show you these slides just before lunch. And another very key thing here is this BVDV is very easily transmissible. It just take as little as one hour of direct contact with a persistently infected animal to transmit BVDV to a healthy animal. Pestigard is the registered vaccine here in Australia from zoitis at that time called Pfizer. It requires two doses initially within a period of six to eight weeks. So remember those mustering videos and it needs to be stored at two to eight degree centigrade. We decided to use E2, the structural protein of BVDV, because of the reports of it being a major immunogenic determinant as well as involved in viral neutralization. As I mentioned, the first step was to have enough protein available with us to do those experiments, to do the adsorption and loading on the nanoparticles. And Tony Cavallaro along with Timani helped in this task and we developed a codon optimized E2 which we could get a yield of about 120 to 160 milligram per liter of culture. We then moved from those solid silica spheres that we used earlier to these hollow mesoporous spheres. Now the reason behind this logic is we are still at the mindset that we want to present the protein on the surface. However, at this stage we were thinking from a regulatory point of view, we would like to inject as less silica as possible. So instead of using a solid silica sphere, why not use a hollow silica sphere which just has a silica wall. So we used this, the size was 120 nanometer, the entrance size was very small. But even using these, we could get very low adsorption. We could get only 80 micrograms per milligram of the particles. Anyway, we conducted a mice trial or a small animal trial with three subcutaneous injections. Once again, we did get an antibody response. We also got a cell mediated response, but it was not better as compared to a traditional adjuvant quillet. And this is when we moved into the next phase of the project. Although small, those results obtained during the first phase of the project with the reinvestment fund gave industry partner Zoitis enough confidence that yes, maybe we can embark on a journey together to develop these silica particle based nano vaccines. At that time, Professor Michael Yu got involved into this project from AIBN and what he designed based on the information that we provided and this is what I would like to stress here. Any technology on its own cannot give you answers unless you sit across the table and discuss what do you want it to do? What are the issues that you would like it to address? What the particles should be tailored to? Not just someone having fun with making n number of particles without finding an application for it. Now these particles they are really sized for endocytosis. Previously, we were using large particles, 100 nanometers or 120 nanometers. Now, the size is only 50 nanometers. Not only that, if you can imagine these particles like golf balls, they have a very, very thin wall. The wall thickness is only 6 nanometer. There is a large internal cavity. Not only that, 
this ball is now perforated with holes and the size of these holes can be controlled. So now we changed our philosophy, we are now looking for the protein to enter into this particles so that we can get a sustained release outside to work towards moving towards a single dose nano vaccine. Now these particles, it is a very simple synthesis process although I must admit I am not a nano person, I am trying to learn as much as I can. But there is a two step synthesis, one is the T1 temperature and another is the T2 temperature. This particular temperature gives us its vesicle formation, regular formation whereas this temperature actually controls the entrance size. So you can see here if the particles are synthesized at 50, you cannot see any entrance pores. If you make it at 100 degrees centigrade, you can see these small dots. These are actually 5 nanometer size entrance pores. And if you synthesize them at 140, you get a bigger, larger hole. So if depending on the size of your protein, you can actually tailor this entrance size so that you can make it enter into the cavity. So using this new generation silica vesicles, 10 is the T1 temperature, 140 is the T2 which gives its entrance size. You can see here we got almost 3 to 4 times increase in our protein loading. Where we were struggling with just 80 or 70 micrograms of protein, here we were able to get about 250 micrograms per milligram of protein. Now this enabled us to do our first mice trial where we could directly compare with Quillet the traditional adjuvant and our vaccine formulation. And as you can see here this time luck was in our favor and we got a higher antibody response as compared to Quille when we used these silica vesicles. Not only that, we got a much higher cell mediated response with the nano vaccine formulation as compared to E2 injected with Quille. So two things, A, we had an increased protein payload B, these particles were eliciting both antibody and cell mediated response. Three, they were acting as self adjuvants. So we did not have to add any other helping agent to this nano vaccine formulation. We then moved and this work was done by the PhD student Karishma Modi. We then moved to a trial because our aim was to reduce the dose number to a long term small animal trial which where we gave only two injections and then left the mice for six months. We took bleeds every month but however recorded also the antibody at the end of the six months to see a long term response. And what you can see these four groups here are actually one of them is Quillet, I am not sure which one but all of these four were statistically similar and in this there is also included a group of freeze dried shelf stored BVDVE2 nano vaccine. Once again you can see here that long term memory response after two injections was also much higher with the nano vaccine formulation as compared to the mice injected with Quillet. Not only that we did some immunohistochemistry analysis once again you can see the total IgG is higher in an SV140 nano formulation as compared to Quillet. We also did massive histopathology because the idea is to lead to an industry application. We wanted to cover all grounds in terms of cytotoxicity. I am not showing all the other data here where we did you know cell line cytotoxicity assays and other assays to know that these particles are non cytotoxic and do not have any effect. However, here you can see we did a large scale histopathology studies as well where we sent I, I do not know Karishma made maybe 2000 slides or something from heart, pancreas, kidney, liver and all these were analyzed. There was no ill effect, no silica deposition anywhere and also the site of injection was perfectly normal. We then, um, I would like to mention here the question we were often asked is what happens to these silica particles once they are injected, you know, where do they go? You are not seeing any deposition, do they break down, silica does not break down, it is an inert material but it will remain as such. Uh, literature shows that they can be excreted out of the system. Karishma did try to collect 
uh, mice urine and fecal samples. She was not very impressed, very frustrated. Oh, they do not wee much at all, you know. It was very hard to collect that wee for her. And another bottleneck that we got stuck was that when we sent it for analysis, it was much lower than the detection limit. Like because we are injecting so less silica, it is very hard to detect the excretion amount. So now we are planning to do some imaging exper uh, experiments where we would like to see what happens to these silica particles, where do they go in the system and how they behave. Not only with BVDV, this gave us the confidence to work on another pathogen, anaplasma or cattle tick fever. The and this is once again another huge disease, severe economic loss and currently there are no safe or efficacious vaccines. The antigens for this were provided to us by Professor Wendy Brown at Washington State University uh, as the outer surface membrane antigens and she suggested that we need to inject 9.1 and 9.2 together. So based on that work we did an animal trial again we had 9.1 on its own which is here but we also injected a mixed nano formulation. So we loaded 9.1 on the silica particles separately, we loaded 9.2 on the silica particles and just mixed it together and injected. That way we could control how much of 9.1 we are putting in, how much of 9.2 we are putting in and then we wanted to look at specific antibody responses and it was really pleasing when we could get antibody response to both 9.1 and 9.2 and we could also get very nice cell mediated response. So this is a very key factor, especially if you are looking at vaccine delivery, especially for multivalent vaccines, this platform can provide an easy way out because you do not have to try to load the antigens on the same particle, but you can use it very easily as a mixed nano formulation. So this is where we are at present, uh, we have done a sheep trial as well. It is a platform technology, we are looking at single dose, we have come down to trials where we have used two doses, we are now in collaborating with International Livestock Research Institute in Kenya where we will be trying, they will do a cattle trial for us for East Coast fever disease. We are also looking at investigating more into the shelf stable nature of this nano vaccine formulation and also it has the translational potential. We started with veterinary vaccines. but. Silica has been approved by FDA in terms of drug delivery as well. And if you go to Cole's supermarket, you will see it is a health supplement called Silicia available to eat. So there are, you know, regulatory issues which could be addressed. Not, I'm not saying that there are not regulatory issues, but still, you know, these regulatory issues, we could start looking at addressing them. And um, um, based on our results, a company has actually contracted us to look at a human vaccine for hepatitis B using these silica nanoparticles. So this is thanks to all the team members as you know these days it has to be collaboronauts, we cannot function otherwise and first phase as well as the second phase of the project. This is about cows. I know it, I thought, you know, I was debating, you know, whether I should talk on just one thing or I should talk on two things and two things got better of me. Let's change gear. Maybe it's refreshing as well rather than just hearing about nano vaccines. So let's talk about something else. Let's talk about plants because I'm a trained plant pathologist. Um, my animal venture is purely based on my learning and help from people like Dr. Tim Mani and others in the animal area. Food security, you know, major burning issue. Mahatma Gandhi says poverty is the worst kind of violence and these days we are becoming so much more aware of these issues. How can we address the issue of food security? Many ways, but one of the ways is to increase crop productivity, whether it is grain crops or it is horticultural crops, we need to aim to increase the productivity, land is not going to increase, resources are going to remain the same. So how do we produce more? One way of producing more is if we can combat the losses caused by plant pathogens and <coughs> pests. One of the things is that you know crop losses could double if we do not use pesticides. We have to use pesticides to protect our crops. But then if you look at those pesticides, it takes about 256 million to research a new crop protection product. 
and only one in 139,000 chemicals make it from the laboratory to the farmer's fields. So it's not an easy way out. But then what happens? Then things like this happen. That is toxicity of these pesticides. This was a really sad news of children dying in India after consuming a community meal where it was having some pesticide residues. 14 children died due to this consumption of these toxic pesticides. So we have to look for alternate things. We have to phase out these toxic pesticides but still achieve crop protection in a sustainable and eco-friendly manner. RNA interference for crop protection, as Ralph mentioned, I've been working on RNA silencing or RNA interference for quite some time, is a very, very powerful tool in our hands. It's one of the, it's got its Nobel Prize awarded to Fire and Mellow for discovery of RNA interference. And this is this powerful tool that we can use for crop protection. I will just, I'm, it's a varied audience, so I'll just take two minutes to explain RNAi and then move on to our work on bioclay. So normally the DNA is double stranded, gives rise to a single stranded RNA and that single stranded RNA forms a protein. This is the normal functioning. However, sometimes the DNA goes naughty and forms double stranded RNA instead of forming a single stranded RNA. This is when the fun begins. Plants or all eukaryotic organisms have deep scissors in their pockets in terms of enzymes. They do not like this double stranded RNA at all. They are not multicultural. They don't like foreigners. And what they do is they chop up this double stranded RNA into small pieces, very precise cutting uh, into 21 to 25 nucleotides. So no protein. Not only that, these 21 to 25 nucleotides then float in the system of the plant or the animal wherever they are searching for their perfect match. So the two strands separate and now they are looking for their perfect ATGGCC sequence to match with or to bind with. And in this case, when they find their perfect match, they actually degrade the messenger RNA. So unlike marriages made in heaven and you know you live ever after when you find your perfect partner, in this case they kill their perfect partner. <laughs> so this is, you know, once again, this is the RNAi pathway. It's a very complicated mechanism. I will not go into the details at all, but just wanted to tell you that we can generate, we can artificially introduce this double-stranded RNA into the plants or introduce constructs into the plants so that it will always form double-stranded RNA specific to the pathogen that we want to control. So we pick up a pathogen sequence and we can genetic modify, genetically modify the plant, have a transgenic crop which will be expressing virus or fungal specific double stranded RNA and these double stranded RNA will not do anything to the plant system. However, whenever the virus will attack, they can kill that virus. So what is the problem? We have this excellent technology, however, it is GM, genetically modified. Therefore, commercialization of RNAi based transgenic or GM crops is highly controlled. We do not have the acceptance as yet, but even if we had the acceptance, it's not easy to generate those transgenic crops. It all sounds very good. You have to have a transformation system, you know, you have to have a system by which you can introduce those genes into the plant to express with avocado. We were trying to make a disease resistant avocado to fight off Thora. It took us four years just to introduce a gene into that avocado plant and we are still analyzing what has happened to it once it's inside the avocado. So it's for tobacco or arabidopsis or tomato it is fine but if you look at range of horticultural crops or a range of grain crops as well it is not very easy to generate GM crops. On top of that they are not acceptable. So you know what should you do you know you can can't spend go on spending your resources on a contingency plan which may not be even acceptable by the community and cost and time involved as well. So this is again, maybe I should say Max Lu to the rescue here, rather than nanoparticles to the rescue. I was giving a talk on RNAi in one of the coffee forums and Professor Max Lu was sitting in that talk. We came out and he said, have you ever tried spraying double stranded RNA on the plants? And maybe we have some nano carriers that might help you 
to spray that double stranded RNA on the plant. And I said, okay, and that is when I started looking at rather than making a GM plant, I know double stranded RNA is the trigger molecule. Can I go and spray double stranded RNA, RNA on a plant and maybe get protection to a virus? And then when you start looking, you know, people have already looked at it. It's not as if I was, you know, first person looking at it and I realized first paper was published by Tenlaro in 2001. They sprayed the double stranded RNA. They were the only these four papers that I could find and two more have come up now. However, and this is what Tellado did, he had pepper mild bottle virus and here you can see the half of the leaf has been sprayed with double stranded RNA targeting this virus and then both sides were challenged with the virus. This side develops infection and you cannot see any leaf lesions here. So yes, double stranded RNA spray works. However, this double stranded RNA like RNA, RNA you when you are working, I do not know how many of you work with RNA in the lab, but if you are working with RNA in the lab, you are almost paranoid because it degrades so fast. You have to sterilize your glassware, plasticware, use DEPC water, use RNA zap to you know, remove any enzyme that can degrade. So if you are spraying on a relief surface where all sorts of nucleases and other things are present you do not expect it to last long and this was the case here as well. The protection only lasted for about 3 to 5 days. You know you spray, if you challenge the virus just after the spray, yes the plant does not get infected. But if the virus comes 3 days later, the spray is no longer effective. And this is what someone else did with sugar, uh, maize plants as well for the sugar cane mosaic virus. Again the protection window was limited to 3 to 5 days. And DSRNA as I mentioned on the leaf surface there is on the atmosphere there is UV, there is rain, all sorts of factors and then there are nucleases. And this is when we designed what we call the killer spray or the postdoc Carl Robinson called it the killer spray clay particle 007. That is we were targeting somehow the aim was let us protect this double stranded RNA by may binding it to some sort of a nano carrier so that it is not degraded on the leaf surface, it is not affected by UV, it is not washed off by rain and that reservoir actually slowly releases that double stranded RNA. So this was the aim when we started working on this and as I, so hence cows to beans. Um, a PhD student Lizzie Worrell is now working on bean common mosaic virus and topical application using bioclay. Ve very powerful disruptive technology if it works. You know, it is like a paradigm shift instead of generating genetically modified plants or using pesticides if you can come up with an idea of spraying what we call bioclay on the crops to protect it from viruses as well as insect pests. So we were looking at non-GM delivery clay, we wanted to use something which is very biodegradable. We are now talking of crops, we are talking of food crops. So you cannot spray them with something which is not acceptable or not degradable, cost effective and we wanted ease of adoption as well. You cannot ask farmers to all of a sudden you know change their application technology of how to deliver that spray. So the particles that we use are invented by Max Lu and Gordon Zhu and these are called layered double hydroxide particles. This is the clay material. They can be cheaply made on a large scale. And if you would like to visualize this, you can visualize it as a rim of paper, you know. They are like thin nano sheets, a stack of paper which is positively charged. When you put the RNA into that stack of paper, RNA is negatively charged and these then go and bind themselves between the sheets on the side of the sheets they hang themselves there. So they get intercalated between these sheets of paper and as the clay degrades these sheets unfold and your double stranded RNA is released. But that is what was the hypothesis and that is what we wanted to test that will it work when sprayed on a crop system. So as can you can see in this cartoon, you know these are the layers, these are positively charged. We can load them with RNA or any DNA, any negatively charged thing. And the mechanism is when you spray it on the leaf, 
there is always with the carbon dioxide and water in the atmosphere there is carbonic acid formation on the leaves. So, the pH of the leaf changes to slightly acidic. So, there are two ways of getting released from these clay particles. One is the clay itself degrades and second is a strong acid will come and displace the double stranded RNA which is negatively charged, but however carbonic acid will come and displace it. It's, these were all hypotheses we had and we wanted to prove it before we worked further on this aspect. And this particular concept as Ralph mentioned was initially funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as their Grand Challenges Explorations Award. Really pleased to say that year there were 2700 applications and I said no chance, you know, two page proposal, what do you have, you know, just a novel idea. But let me tell you, this is the generation of the idea, you know, this is the time if you have a powerful idea and you strongly believe in it, you can, you know, sort of make the wheels move. So, put this idea to Gates Foundation, as I said, 2700 applicants, just 23 got selected, only one from Australia. So, we were the lucky ones to get that funded initially. For the first time then, when then we expressed the double stranded RNA from three different viruses, we got Tenlado to give us the pepper mild mottle double stranded RNA, we had cucumber mosaic virus DSRNA, we had some control DSRNA and what we did was we loaded that to LDH to form what we call bioclay. So, if you look in these lanes, they are different ratios of clay to DSRNA. When it is not bound to the particles, you can see it in the gel. But once it is bound, it does not move, it remains in the well. So, that gave us an indication, okay, at 1 is to 4 ratio, it is completely bound. There is no free DSRNA available and we, the best part was not only pure double stranded RNA, but even crude total RNA which you extract from a bacterial system was able to bind completely to these particles. So, the, here the point is we want as less cost as possible as less complications as possible when we are looking at it as a practical delivery system. And here is an electron micrograph TEM done by someone in Gordon Zoo's lab, Jason, and you can see the thread of double stranded RNA here. It was very difficult to capture that on a TEM because it degrades very fast when you have that electron beam coming. We then did, I am again not showing all the data, we did elaborate experiments we have done to show that this LDH clay when sprayed on the plants actually degrades. So, this is on done in a glass house condition and it degrades by about 20 percent each week. It just breaks up into aluminum and magnesium. So, this clay is just made out of aluminum and magnesium and every week it degrades by about 15 to 20 percent. So, that at the end of 6 to 8 weeks there will be just free aluminum and magnesium left, which is anyway a part and parcel of the plant system. We then wanted to test, you know, the key thing, whether the, uh, this will be protected. So, we treated naked, this is naked double stranded RNA and this is the LDH DSRNA. So, you can see the naked DSRNA, you can see the LDH bound DSRNA in the well. After RNA's treatment, the, this is still bound in the well, but the naked DSRNA starts to degrade. Similarly, we were found that UV treatment naked DSRNA disappears, whereas we had the LDH bound DSRNA which was still protected, but this was still all in the lab. And this you can see here is from the pepper mild mottle virus. So, we sprayed all plants on day 0, but challenged them with the virus on the same day after day 5 of the spray, day 10 of the spray, day 15 of the spray, day 20 of the spray. And you can see here, even after 20 days of spray, we could not detect any viral symptoms on the plant. So, this was a big leap from the 5 day protection window that we were getting from the work earlier when they were spraying only naked DSRNA as compared to bioclay. So, progress so far, yes, easy cost effective synthesis of clay. We can load any size of DSRNA, it is stable, lasts for 30 days, protection against local and systemic infection and we have generated extra data as well. So, this is the various team now, New Farm has come up as our industry partner and this was Bioclay version 1. We also have a Bioclay version 2 for insect pests which um, as time will not permit me to talk here, which is specifically for insect pests.
The idea is maybe to have you know that magical killer spray where you can put double stranded RNA of a virus of an insect pest maybe of a fungus together in a single formulation voodoo magical spray and just spray it on the plants and see what happens whether they are protected from everything or not. Um, uh, this is just my last slide just wanted to say not only because I am now heavily invested at looking at you know innovative nanotechnology especially for sustainable and profitable agriculture other than bio clay and nano vaccines we are I have got an ARC linkage grant on novel nano pesticides with Professor Michael Lewis the lead CI. We are also looking at nano delivery of herbicides and we are looking at what is called a micro propagator. Once again maybe you will hear about this in about 15 days time a little bit more and this is Im to improve horticultural crop propagation where we are trying to look at whether we can use these technologies to actually make maybe the crop root better or grow better or form flowers earlier all such interventions which could be done with such a powerful tool in our hand. And yes thank you from team Nina we have a way. Yeah, honestly, this is all my team work. I, this is, I'm just presenting it here, but credit goes to the key people in my lab who really have made it worthwhile for me to come here and present this work. Thank you.